Hi, I'm Don Rourke, and Sam covered pretty much everything, I think. Um, I'm from Minto. We have, I, had, I just put together a list of all the equipment that we use. Um, I'm certainly not an expert, but we have a pile of iron. Where are you pointing up? I'll point it. So, we use... We have a case precision disc, 40 foot, so zero till disc, seven and a half inch spacing, single shoot. Um, we can use it to overseed. We can use it for a lot of our small seed because we, we also have a Concord, which is not great for sowing canola as anybody who's ever sowed with a Concord. Um, we have a Concord with shovels and sweeps and full disc levelers on every row. We have spreader boots on the back, so we can broadcast sweet clover seed as we're sowing barley or oats or wheat, whatever we like. And we just purchased a 24 row, 30 inch planter. We did 30 inch rows in beans a couple years ago um, with the disc drill just by plugging runs, but it wasn't, it wasn't accurate enough. Plus we were plugging something like 48 runs out of 64. It was a lot of back pressure. It didn't work with a dart. I did it for about 400 acres and stopped. Um, it is in, it, it's kind of, it's got every damn option you would want. It's almost too much. Uh, we have an Einbach here. We bought that brand new when we started going organic and we wouldn't be without it. Last year we bought uh, Kovar Hero sections and mounted them on Delmar bar. I don't remember exactly what it cost, but it was quite, there's a lot less money than Einbach. We have used a Powermatic Harrow um, or Herman Harrow. Um, the four bar, typical Herman Harrow with a four bar isn't quite enough. Uh, the Powermatic was better, it had five bar. But we, but we wouldn't be without the Einbach or the Kovar. We do have a rotary hoe and as Sam mentioned, it does have its places. Um, yellow mustard, you can't harrow that in our experience. Flax doesn't like to be harrowed. Um, beans when they're small, soybeans when they're small, you can get out a little bit at hook um, before you can with a harrow. Uh, and then we have row crop cultivators, um, 12 row 30s. We have set up, of course, when we had a 40 foot, 40 foot disc drill, it, that was a 16 row 30. So we have, we had our, all our row crop cultivators set up for 16 rows. So now we're taking them back to 12 row. In the meantime, last year we row crop cultivated on seven and a half. So we took our 16 rows, spread it everything, spread it all the trees for all the S tines. So now we're, they, we're we've done a lot of modifications. Um, we also purchased a suck up uh, row crop cultivator. So just a single wide blade, high residue. Um, Hopefully we use it. I guess it's, we have it. It didn't cost a lot of money. Uh, just for people that don't know what row crop cultivators, there's, there's S tines, which you can have one, three, or five tines per row. There's the C shanks, which usually have one or three shanks per row. And then there's the Y blade high residue, which is just one shank per row. Um, there's the rolling Lilliston, as Sam mentioned. There's, there's camera guided or wand guiding, the sliding hitch, there's pivoting hitches. One thing to remember is that with a sliding hitch, your three-point hitch arms on your tractor have to remain solid, like solid, they do not swing at all. And then the pivoting hitch, you want that hit, your three-point hitch arms, you pull out all the stops so it can swing. Um, like the buffalo hitch that Sam mentioned, we do have one, we haven't used it because we actually didn't have the right cultivator. Um, you need a lot of rigid coulters, cutting coulters in the ground so that when that hitch steers, it, the, the cultivator will grab the ground and move. I don't know how well it'll ever work in our country because we have too many rocks. I've smashed a lot of coulters on rocks because I don't really want to go slow. Uh, for light tillage, we just good cultivators. Uh, DMI Tiger made 50 feet, six inch spacing, nine inch shovels. Run it, as Sam said, very, very shallow for seed bed prep. I think our one thing we wouldn't be without is we got rolling baskets to go behind our cultivators, just their, their own individual units. 
So if it's too, if it's too wet, you can't use them because they plug up. Um, but they make, they break up clods. They'll, if you got foxtail barley, it'll knock all the soil off the roots. Um, makes a heck of a nice seabed. But you got to be cautious. If it's going to be dry, you can get a, you, it's not quite a land roller, but you can lose a lot. It'll blow if you're not careful. Heavy tillage, we have a summer's disc, 40 feet, 10 inch disc spacing. We have a cross disc, it's a bit more of a finishing disc. Um, we did have a high speed disc and I don't wanna talk about it. Uh, and then we have deep tillers, which we use just in the fall. We never pull a deep tiller out in spring. Um, this fall, of course, we didn't get anything done. Uh, the extras that we have, we, per we found a used Lasco weed zapper. They're two different brands, but same idea. Uh, 26 foot unit down in the States. This fall we tried it. Um, Dad thinks it's a good idea. I'm not sure what we're all gonna use it for. It's, it's a last ditch effort, I think. Um, Sam and I actually talked about on the phone a little bit about Lasco and the weed zapper. Um, one thing I will say is we did light the field on fire with it. And we had 180 horsepower on it and it, that, it's only 26 feet and it put it on its knees. So realist, we were thinking, you know, maybe we should get like a hundred foot wall. Jesus. Uh, we do have a comb cut. We have used it. I think dad used it fairly successfully a couple years ago. This year we really didn't um, use it. We, we kept trying it. We couldn't find a niche for it. Um, we like big is better. So we actually have two comb cuts and we mounted them on a swather. So we got 40 feet of comb cut so we can go out and rip around and try it wherever. Um, one thing Sam didn't mention is, and we haven't done it, I think maybe Nick Boundy was going to try it at one point, throw Nick under the bus, was flaming. Um, some people down in the States, it's, it, they, it's widely used. Um, it's very popular. I haven't got too excited about it. Um, steam, there is companies out there looking at steam for non-selective weed control. Um, we've looked into it and it doesn't look like it's economical. You need so much water um, to make saturated steam to kill weeds, it's not economical. And that's about it. The only other thing I was gonna mention was uh, autonomous stuff, robots and all that jazz. I was down at Moses last week and they were getting all excited about it and uh, I sold equipment for Case for a little while any new tractor coming off the lot can be autonomous right now. All it needs is a modem and the software. So the, it, it's there, it's just the, uh, from what I know, the companies are too terrified <laughs> to just let it roll. But uh, right now you could get us, uh, get a quad track and they have the technology available. If you're in the field with one tractor, you can operate another tractor. It, the technology is there, so you can have you can be cultivating on one side, and you can have one running right beside you with nobody in the cab, but you're manually operating it. So it is out there. We keep looking at it because we run a lot of acres, and uh, but it's not there yet. That's it. Hi everyone, um, I'm going to take a turn a little bit and kind of go away from weed control. I'm going to talk about, uh, well first off my name is Tyler Keats. We, we got a 1600 organic grain and broiler operation. We're just west of Saskatoon. With the help of my family it's, it's been working out pretty good lately. Um, I'm just going to talk about a handful of things we've done the last few years that have really helped us out. Helped us, they, they save time and money and they're just simple projects that, you know, some of you might be interested in, in doing yourself. Just gonna give a little bit of background information on myself. Uh, I grew up, it was just strictly a poultry operation. So I knew nothing about uh, grain farming, honestly. Uh, in 2014 was the first year we got into organic grain. So I, I was learning a lot, you know, all the practices with organic, you know, the soil health and uh, the machinery associated with it, different crop rotations and everything. You know, I also have an engineering background, so 
I kind of took attention to the machinery, learning about the machinery as much as I can, because I knew that was something that I could understand and adapt to quite quickly. So first year, we're trying to take off a couple hundred acres of wheat and trying to find a combine to do so. You know, I had never operated a combine before. <laughs> In fact, I didn't know the difference between a conventional and a rotary. Not your typical grain farm. I didn't grow up with it. So, so I pulled this Massey 751 out of the shed. It was in my uncle's on in a shed on my uncle's land across the road. Been there since he bought the land. I didn't know anything about the history of it. Nothing. My main goal was to just learn more about a combine. Find you know, find out what to look for if I'm going to buy a combine. Sure enough, I decided to try it out in the field. A few bearings, a couple of belts. Got through. Did the trick. One thing this taught me is you know sometimes this old machinery can be pretty functional still and. Uh, yeah, no, it's not the perfect thing for our operation, but you know, maybe you can give some of this old stuff some new life and, and maybe do some adaptations that some of the new equipment have to make them work for you. Get the most out of your equipment is always beneficial. So now I'm going to go through a handful of things that we've done. First thing is I've built all my own grain bin temperature sensors. I've got to give credit to a good friend of mine from university. He actually implemented this on his farm first, and he kind of forwarded it on to me and how to do it. Basically, it's low-cost low components. It's just thermistors wired into Ethernet cable, so I can get up to seven sensors on a cable. And I just use a braided cable and, uh, and pipe to protect them and hang them in your bin. And then that there's just a picture of the reader I built. Uh, you just plug it in and write down your numbers as you go in. I figure I have less than $20 a cable put into these in materials. I mean, so basically nothing. Obviously, there's some labor involved in soldering them together and things like that, but I did that in front of the TV. Another thing, um, hydraulic auger. As we started growing a little bit, uh, we needed, had the demand for having a more reliable loadout auger. I didn't want trucks sitting in the yard, especially at you know, minus 30 and trying to get an old piece of junk engine started. <laughs> uh, so we had this auger sitting in the back. I don't know how old it is. I think Dad used it for coal back before I remember. I had a look at it. Tubing and flighting were in excellent condition still. So I thought, hey, maybe I can power this a different way. So sure enough, I. I found a hydraulic motor, sized it appropriately to the flow on the skid steer that we had, and, and hitched it up like that. And then I went and modified the frame so I can pick it up and move it around with the skid steer. So that's my mover. You know, it's been real handy because it's, it's very reliable. It, we keep the skid steer inside, so it's going to start. And that's a machine we already have. I know the skid steer's not a cheap, cheap machine, but it's something we already have for the boiler operation. And also the reversing hydraulic, so it's easily reversed for clean out and things like that. This is a one, we don't actually have this anymore, but uh, it was a very simple upgrade on something that we weren't happy with the performance on. So we had a Leon push type manure spreader. The push types aren't quite as good that we find, especially with chicken litter being, being quite light. As you start spreading the manure, it's, it's just compressing. So, so it's just trickling out the back. You're going through the field at two mile an hour, not very efficient. And once you get to the end, you're going about eight, nine mile an hour and you're trying to do an even job, and you're just not doing a good job spreading. So just a simple solution, I just put another flow control valve on the tractor, so I can use two, two hydraulic remotes, and, uh, and then I can run a high flow at the beginning and shift it down to a low flow at the end. You still gotta tweak your speed a little bit, but that helped a lot, and it was just a couple hundred dollars worth of hydraulics, so we were able to save ourselves a couple days a year in the field. This is something I'm sure you've all seen before. You can buy drop pans and the sample cleaners. You know, they're, they're super simple. Um, so, as I said before, I'm always trying to get more out of the equipment, and I'm kind of an experience with it, you know. I, I, I don't know how to, I never knew how to set a combine six years ago. <laughs> I've never done it before, so I'm trying to figure this all out at the same time. So, I built my own drop pan and sample cleaner. Just drop pan consists of just a tray off a toolbox and an electromagnet to drop the pan. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but hey, I can draw it from the cab, it works good. Then the little sample cleaner I put together last year just to kind of get more accurate results of the losses. The main reason I built this is anyone that's done hemp, the chaff is typically quite green, and it gets difficult to separate that chaff from the seed and get an accurate resembling, resemblance of your losses. This has two components, kind of a Milwaukee, just a Milwaukee vacuum, use the blower side. And then I just use some ABS pipe. There's a lower section and an upper section, and in that middle I have a window screen in there. And that suspends the product, it lets your airflow at the, it, down below, get nice and stable and laminar so you don't have a fast jet in one part of the tube and the other. And then, then obviously, you turn it on and float your chaff out the top. Simple, works good. Again, I'm sure you've all seen this before, remote hoist and uh, shoot control on, on the 
tandem truck or something. Dad borrowed uh, my uncle's truck last year because we were hauling grain from the far land. And he was commenting afterwards, you know, it's pretty nice not having to run back and forth to lift the chute a little bit more or, or lift the box a little bit more and stand in the dust opening the chute. So I just decided to use pneumatics. You know, you already have an air source on that tandem truck. So next, and I built my own, you know. Yeah, I, I could have gone out and bought one, but I had trouble justifying it. We're planning on maybe putting a new box on that truck in a couple years anyways, because it's kind of beat up a little. <laughs> so just consists of pneumatics and uh, some some uh, pneumatic valves, obviously, and uh, wireless wireless remotes to control the relays on it. This is the last one I'm going to talk about here. Is uh, always wanted, you know, nice to have lighting out in out in the bin yard during harvest. But you only are out there a few days a year. It seems like because you're always moving to the next bin, and the light's not in the great spot. So it didn't really make sense to spend a bunch of money on some lighting that you're only going to turn them on a couple times a year. So this here, that boom I built a few years ago to put up trusses as we do a lot of our construction ourselves and things like that. It's handy for all sorts of things on the farm. So I had the idea of put a, put a light on the end of that. I can reach just about 40 feet in the air with that, fully extended, and put a 300 watt LED bulb. It's worked great. You know, it's great overhead. Put it right on the auger tractor so it always follows the auger around and, and the location is nice so the shadowing isn't bad at all either. If anyone's looking into stuff like this, it's uh, just a few little th tips that I like to try to follow when I'm looking into it. You know, get as much information as you can. Talk to friends, use the internet, you know. Look at, look at existing equipment out there. Sometimes there's stuff on one piece of equipment that you can implement onto something else. You know, and find what fits into your operation. What fits, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for you. You know, that's why I utilize some of the machines like the skid steer for loading grain, you know. It's something we already had. Think it through, try to think of the issues that you might have. You know, there's always going to be hiccups along the way. And something very simple, you don't have to overcomplicate it, something very simple can, can really help you out a lot, make, make something a lot easier for you. And obviously not everything's going to work. For every item I mentioned here, I'm sure I've spent a few days in the shop with uh, failed ideas and <laughs> things like that. But it's always fun to learn about it, and even, even on those failed projects, you learn a lot too. That's all I have today. All right, so um, I can run around mics uh, to anybody out in the crowd who had any questions for any three of the gentlemen up there. Well, I had a burning question that I wanted to ask, so I'll take the opportunity. Uh, I guess, Don, you'd kind of said, yeah, we got a Yetter, you know, rotary hoe, and, you know, it's got some place in adaptability. Sam, you'd had a slide that said handles residue, kind of, sort of, which was our question with it. We found it didn't really handle residue. Is there modifications to rotary hose to allow them to handle residue better? Well, I was just going to say there's two. There is high residue rotary hose and then not high residue rotary hose. Okay. Depends on the residue, too. If it's corn stalks, no. Mm -hmm. if, like, if it's big stalks, it'll just stick through and jam. Um, but if you want to gather up twine. <laughs> <laughs> or barbed wire, or barbed wire, I tell you that as well. Thank you. Uh, I guess the one other thing I'll add is um, uh, for people that are doing, you know, more wider space crops, you can also just use rotary hole units, you know, just over the row, and they'll they'll plug up a lot less. But of course, you know, you can't use them uh, uh, for cereal grains as much when you do that. Hi, this is probably directed at Sam. Um, in a solid seeding situation, not row crop, um, pre-emergence pre harrowing, is there a concern of filling in the ditch that's left by your packer wheel, making your seed depth deeper than what you had originally planned on? Yeah, d definitely. Uh, I think of that when I was doing research with carrots, you know, same thing. We'd have a uh, leftover from the press wheel. The carrots would just be coming up and we'd fill that in and that would always be a problem. Um, 
definitely a concern. Two ideas. One, if you, it, it, the better control you're able to get on your harrow to throw just a little bit of soil, you know, so whether that's one of the newer models that, that can work a lot more shallowly and consistently. The other thought is, depending on how well you can steer your harrow, if you can lift up a tine or two right over the row um, so that you can still be somewhat aggressive nearby, but you're not throwing soil right on the row. Okay, so I have two questions. The first one is for Sam. So I think if I remember back to your presentation, which wasn't far ago, but you were talking about harrowing before seeding. And are you recommending to always harrow before seeding? I would say if you, well, it doesn't have to be harrowing. It can be anything that's going to work shallowly. And I would say if you can, if you can f make time for that, yeah, I'll always do that. You're going to kill that flush of weeds. Um, another, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's nice that you say that, Sam, but we don't always have the time to make an extra pass through the field. So I think it's the ideal and, and you make it work as best you can. But the other thing is make the most of your passes through the field. So like, do you have a front hitch on your tractor? Because that gives you, you know, you can make two operations in one, or can you mount something in front of your seeder in the back um, so that you're able to do that sort of stale seedbed pass in one pass. But yeah, if, if possible, that's always going to lower your weed density. Even for you know really early seeded crops where you're not really getting that emergence at that time, oh, you think you could potentially just be causing more of a flush. That's that's a good point. On? Yeah, depending on how early you're going and I guess the weeds in your area. You know, right? Good point. If you have nothing that's coming up at that time, then you might not need to do it. Yeah. And then my next question is for Tyler. So you are obviously very mechanically inclined and. You can basically turn around a lot of old equipment. Is there any new equipment that you've purchased for grain farming? <laughs> yeah, you know, as I've learned more about it, it, it's a lot easier to make that investment in, into newer equipment, you know. For me, the big thing is, is learning about where to put that investment. I'm always hesitant to spend the money when I'm not comfortable with it, you know, and I, I always try to do as much research as I can before. Um, we, we, we got a high speed disc now. It's, we find for us it's a very good uh, seed bed or incorporation tool for our, our manure because you know you don't have to go too 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 deep with it and things like that. But the disc also buries the manure, our chicken manure, so so you don't have it volatized. And that's another thing we we've also upgraded uh, is our spare. You know that one there we don't have anymore. We've gone to a a tube line and it has a poultry attachment on it. And I've tried. I've talked to a number of reps across the prairies. I don't know anyone in the prairies that owns one. Maybe some of you do, but I've never met anyone that actually owns one of these poultry attachments. And what it is is basically it's three horizontal beaters inside an enclosed box that drop it down onto a disc. And, and it works a lot better for the light material. We're able to get, you know, 40 plus feet of spread out of it instead of more around 18 with our other vertical beater. I, I'm curious to hear from these two. That's something that, that I've seen over in Europe, especially the Nordic countries, where they're doing band sewing. So I, I always like to mention it, but at least by me in the Midwest, it's, it's not very common at all, especially because it, it's hard to find the machinery to, to seed that. Sorry, what was the question? I didn't hear it. Band sewing? No. But I mean, similar to the Dutch opener, that actually instead of having, a, like, well, it spreads the seed out. So it effectively is like that, is not? Yeah, but not row, not row crop cultivating like Sam was talking about. Not at all, in my experience. Don, I've got a question for you, and I know you're going to love this question. Probably not. <laughs> Tell us more about the high-speed disc. <laughs> I, I, the reason I asked that question is I, uh, we use a easy-on disc, uh, tandem offset disc, and we do 
you know, we do 1,500, 1,800 acres of green manure a year at least. And uh, you know how much fun it is to run a tandem disc with uh, gangs and rocks and uh, bearings. And uh, we rented a pro till last year for the first time to sort of fill in some acres. And uh, as you know, we took a look at your uh, Landol. And I'm interested in trying a few other brands of high-speed disc. I just, I just want you to tell us a little bit more why you don't want to use it or what the issue is with it. And I know I, I sort of know the answer, but I thought, heck, what? Let's hear it out in public. <laughs> um, first off, they're hard on tractors. It's flat out. My dollar old staggers and versatiles they weren't designed to go 8, 9, 10 mile an hour. Um, we had a 30 foot high speed disc, it would put 500 horse on his knees. Um, if it was wet, it would plug, uh, especially tall green manure. We have a summer's disc, and not all 10 of discs are built the same at, at all, right? There's good ones with spring trips, there's sea shanks, there's good bearings and there's bad bearings, like, right? They're heavy or they're not. Um, we also found we had what? five different high-speed discs out in a field and getting out and digging behind them as per how they're cutting it off. The land all on the Degelman, um, if you move the soil away, it cut it like this. It didn't matter how fast you went, how deep you went, um, it would just cut it like this. Every high-speed disc I've seen has some type of packer on the back. You can get rolling baskets, but they're quite uncommon, and the resale's even worse on them, because the conventional guys don't want them. Um, so we, three years ago, we used the high-speed disc quite a bit, and it would just replant foxtail barley. But that's not what I want, not even a little bit. So we haven't found a use for it. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll turn in green manure, but it's 30 feet and it takes 500 horse and it puts it on its knees and then we put that tractor in the shop. We have to do re all the ax redo all the axle seals because it's been shook to a lot. Um, but if you like one, go right, go right ahead. I'll sell, I'll sell you one. <laughs> so Tyler, you, you use a high-speed disc as well. Did you want to speak to your experience? You guys are in completely different growing regions, which... I'm not sure if that has an impact or not. Yeah, I guess, I mean, we've, we've been happy with ours. You know, like I said, our, our number one use for it is incorporating. You know, we're able to, we're able to go pretty shallow and get that manure incorporated into the ground so, 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 we're not, so it's not volatizing. And then, uh, and then we're sandy land, so we're always moisture limited too. So I really like the backers that follow it as well for that reason. And is this the main purpose for you guys for the manure incorporation? Or are you guys using it with residue, your green manure, or are you guys use, utilizing other equipment? Yeah, no, we're also using it for incorporating our green manure and things like that too. And, and then another reason that we like it, I guess, is uh, we also do a fair bit of hemp. So we, we've never had trash issues with it on the hemp either with that. No, we never have on ours. No wrapping. No wrapping. It's a Vatterstad carrier. The other thing is resale sucks, absolutely sucks. A thirty in the thirty, the price of them have gone up. I sold equipment. The price of a Degemon went up like forty thousand dollars from two years ago to now, but that didn't raise the price of what was previously sold. So guys are get like if you buy one, you're gonna take a huge hit if you want to get rid of it. I just caution you, like it's terrible. It's only worse than seeding equipment, the depreciation on them. It's bad. It's like a, it's almost like a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, K-Line makes one and Case just bought out K-Line and K-Line's an Australian company and they actually make the, they actually make the discs movable. So as your discs wear, they start with bigger discs, they're 24 inch discs. And as the discs wear, you can actually move them together so that you're basically, you don't have the ridging effect where they're not really tilling. I don't know if anybody's ha had any experience with them, but I, Flamin has them, you can rent them. So my theory is don't buy them. I mean, they're hugely overpriced. I mean, until you know what you want and what you've got uh, to work with. But uh, 
they are a scary thing on at 10 mile an hour or 8 mile an hour. But, you know, I've talked to a lot of producers and it sounds like you don't need to run them at 10 mile an hour, but they're still going to use horsepower. But, uh, you know, during July, we're trying to put down just, we're, tr we're having to do two passes with a tandem offset disc uh, to work in our green manure crops. And so it's going to take two passes with either a high speed disc or a, a slower tandem offset disc. So we, we just, we need to either add to our tandem offset disc or consider a high speed disc. But uh, price and, uh, you know, it's they've just gone through the roof. And I, I, I have questions about them too. But I was interested in that K line design because I think it accommodates some of that disc wear and, and lack of coverage. Well, if you think about it this way, so a 40 foot Duggeman Pro Tool costs you about $150,000. You're going to need 620 horsepower to pull that sucker up and down the field. So you're probably going to have to buy a tractor too. Or you could buy a 40 foot Summers, like a diamond disc, which you can turn with in the ground. That's the beauty of the Summers diamond disc for 70, 80 grand. It's pretty simple to me. Um, I just had a question on your Vatterstad disc. What kind of discs are you running on it? Um, are you using their cross cutter discs or just regular discs? Just the regular discs. It's the uh, it's the older model, the 820, not the 825. I think the 825 goes to a bigger disc. Okay. Um, but one one thing that we've noticed about it compared to others is, is the wear on it's been exceptional. We we only have like half an inch of wear on the discs, and we've probably put. I don't know, 15,000 acres on it. Okay, thanks. Well, I want to uh, remind everybody to give uh, the three presenters a, an applause. It was uh, stimulated some interesting ideas.